We're here today. This is uh, this month's Think Shop webinar presented by uh, Bolt and the Retail Coalition. Um, and excited, though I guess some of us are not excited to discuss the cookie apocalypse. Certainly sounds um, scary. Scariest way to discuss cookies. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think this is, uh, we're looking forward to spending about the next half hour to discuss uh, how this impacts digital marketing and um, how we can prepare for it. So um, I think before we get into our introductions, just um, wanted, you know, we were looking over that. Um, seems like every kind of week now we're getting updates to um, security or cookies or iOS changes really impacting how we are dealing with um, how digital marketers are having to deal with top of the funnel, but then also how merchants are having to deal with mid and bottom and then post uh, purchase acquisition. And so that's what we'll be touching on some today and some of these those points uh, and just kind of going through who we're, who's on the panel today. Myself, I am a senior director of retail advocacy at Bolt. So I came from the merchant side uh, in e-commerce for about 10 years, uh, worked mostly in furniture uh, e-commerce. And as uh, my role in retail advocacy, I, um, I advocate on behalf of our merchants internally, but then also worked for their optimization externally. Um, and I'll toss to Brittany. Thanks, Ian. Uh, my name is Brittany Blanchard. I am a VP of Client Services with Metric Theory, a part of Media Monks, focused specifically on performance marketing. Uh, I do feel like I need to explain this is not a Zoom background behind me. This is a mural in one of the <laughs> conference rooms in our Denver office where I'm based. Uh, and I actually heard that peak last week right there. Um, but at Metric Theory, I oversee paid search, paid social, and e-commerce focused teams. And in my role working with our client services team, I have the opportunity to have conversations with dozens of clients across industries about what's top of mind for them today. And what we're talking about today is, of course, one of the hottest topics out there. So I'm excited to be here and chatting with you and Greg. Okay. Brittany, just so you know, your audio is coming in and out a little. I think when you're closer to the computer, it sounds good. Great. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, no worries. I think mean, Greg? Yep. Hey, everyone. I'm Greg Greiner. I lead the product and design teams at Bolt. Been at the company for coming up on three years now. Um, prior to Bolt, uh, I was at at Uber, leading the Uber for Business product team. And, and many years prior to that, I had my own e-commerce business. So a lot of these challenges are, are near and dear to my heart. And as the landscape has been changing um, in this area, this is a, a big topic at Bolt um, for the product and tech teams, both in terms of how we solve these challenges internally as Bolt builds its own product and services, and also how we partner with our, our retail partners to solve this for them as well. So excited to dive in. Great. So I think um, as we, sorry, um, we sent out a survey as we were going through this um, registrations here, received almost 100, more than 150 responses. And, and one of the questions is what are cookies and, and what are we even really talking about here? So we thought it'd be good to start to have Brittany just sort of walk us through um, what, what we're even discussing here. Sure, so Brittany, I'll, I'll let you my... take it. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, we did notice uh, in the survey responses that there were a good number of questions around what exactly is happening. And I think it's a really fair question. So let's just level set before we get into tactics on how to approach. So if, if you're not familiar, the quote unquote cookie apocalypse is related to the fact that Google announced its plans to phase out support for third party cookies in its browser Chrome. And so some are calling this the cookie apocalypse because so much of what we're used to when it comes to digital marketing and how we think about websites and how we interact with them depends on third party cookies. Uh, so we actually wanted to also make sure to take a step back and define cookies. So if you go to the next slide, I think this is one of those things where, you know, myself as a digital marketer, I took for granted for a long time, you know, this was something behind the scenes, I didn't need to understand how this worked. Uh, but obviously, it's much more at the forefront of what's happening today. So it's good to know cookies are small text files that are saved locally to your device when you visit a website. And generally speaking, there are two types of cookies that people are often talking about. We have first party cookies and we have third party cookies. So first party cookies are pretty straightforward. These are cookies that are owned, generated, placed by the website that you're visiting. So uh, I'll give an example. If I were to go to amazon.com, any cookie that is placed by Amazon while I'm on that site, that's a first party cookie. And it might be used to remember the products that I put in my cart for later, 
or remember my username and password so I don't have to enter it next time. It's generally considered things that enhance the user experience. Um, so first party cookies are not really what we're talking about today. Instead, we're talking about third party cookies. So these are cookies placed on a site uh, that are generated by a third party, by someone else other than that site. So same example, if I were on amazon.com, any cookie generated by anyone other than Amazon is third party. So for example, a Google cookie that might be noting my browsing behavior in order to serve me relevant ads later across the Google Display Network. Um, so that would be a third party cookie. And the main advantage of these is really to enable tracking of behavior and um, enable things like retargeting to enable attribution and measurement, things like frequency capping. So if you wanna control the number of times someone is seeing your ad across the internet, um, and then also insights and segmentation of audiences all really rely on these third party cookies. So in terms of thinking about how does this affect me? How is this going to affect my business? It really does come down to retargeting, the tracking visibility, since we will no longer be able to cookie people who see or interact with our ads on other sites. And then audience targeting built on information that you're not directly collecting on your site or doesn't come from your CRM. So for example, if you target in-market audiences or interest-based audiences, those are dependent on third-party cookie. So an another question that we got was, when is this happening? So on the next slide, we have uh, a little bit of information around this. Reality is it's already happening. It's been happening. Um, and actually Firefox was the first mover here. They made it the default to block third-party cookies on their browser in September of 2019. So almost two years ago. And then Apple quickly followed suit with Safari. They blocked cookies, uh, third-party cookies by default in March of last year. And so this announcement is Google saying they will do the same on Chrome. And on the next slide, we have the reason why this is a big deal, which is because Chrome has about two thirds of the desktop browser market. So while we've already seen this happening with Firefox and with Safari, this is the big one. Once we have uh, Chrome essentially limiting third-party cookies, now we've got all players in the space, essentially most browsers and experiences that people have will no longer be using third-party cookies. So I mean, that was amazing. Thank you. I think that is really useful in explaining it. Um, I mean, so... I think what's best is really, we got so many questions and like I said, we got more than 150 responses. So I just wanted to take the next 20 minutes or so. And if there are any additional questions from anyone who's watching, please put them in the Q and A and we'll try to get to them. But um, really wanted to take the time of your expertise and Greg's expertise to walk through these questions. The first of which that we got, I think resoundingly was how do we combat the cookie apocalypse? And I think that's like, I just want to kind of re reposition that because I think when we say combat it, it's, um, it makes it sound like something we're going to be constantly fighting as opposed to the idea that we just really have to change how we operate as marketers and merchants and, um, and software partners. So um, yeah, I'll let you guys take you. Um, how, do, how do we combat that? This? What are tactics moving forward? Yeah, I, I can kick us off. It's a huge question. Um, and I liked your comment, Ian. It's not it's not about combating it, really. It's, it's adapting to it. Um, and I think it's important to have the mindset and to remember that cookies were never perfect. So I just talked about the fact that, you know, Firefox did this two years ago. We saw Safari do this at the beginning of last year. Um, and then there are also ad blockers, right? There are some people who blocked cookies of their own volition for a long time. And based on what I've researched and what I've read, um, between those three factors, already 40% of web traffic is coming from users who are blocking third-party cookies. So we already have limited uh, insight through the cookies. And then things like you know, cross-device activity, multiple users using the same device in a household, things like that, it was never really perfect. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to, to remember that this is the cookie apocalypse, but it's not all that apocalyptic because we are going to be able to continue to track and target ads based on first party data, which I'm sure we'll be talking more about. Um, and those data sources won't be impacted, but also there are alternatives to cookie based targeting like contextual targeting, serving your ads on web pages that have relevant content that has existed for a long time and will continue to exist. Um, and then I think my, my last point here on kind of how to, how to think about this and prepare for this moving forward at, at a high level is uh, we've got a really interesting case study with the recent rollout of iOS 14 and what that's done for Facebook in particular. So iOS 14, of course, 
uh, gave users of iOS devices the option to opt out of cross app tracking. So if you're on the Facebook app and then you go into your Chrome app to make a purchase, we've now lost that visibility for the majority of iOS users. And it's had, it's been a massive shift. It's had a significant impact on data visibility, on actual performance, uh, in our ability to accurately target users, but we're navigating it. We haven't seen a huge um, shift in investment away from the Facebook platform. We've seen advertisers adapting over the last few months. So I think that's good reason to have faith that the same thing will happen with, with the deprecation of third-party cookies. I think something funny that I've seen on Twitter is people actually complaining that when they turned off their iOS targeting, they started getting ads for things they didn't care about. Right. And so they kind of wanted to turn it back on. Um, but Greg, what are your thoughts on on like how do we move forward from this? Yeah, I think I think Brittany gave a really good summary. I think the, the couple things I'll add is, uh, like she said, it's really just a continuation of things that have already been happening. And I think um, one of the things that uh, retailers in particular need to to be thinking deeply about is is as Brittany described, this was never a perfect mechanism. So how do you build these mechanisms where you can better understand your customers and other means? Um, and one of the things, both things a lot about is identity, right? And how can you leverage identity as a means to better understand customers cross device, even um, cross platform, regardless of, of the situations where you, where you can't track users anonymously. Um, and so thinking about how you kind of build up your identity system um, so that you understand your users better at a more direct level. Um, and then the second point is, is I, I don't think this will be the last uh, step in this direction that these companies take, right? This is a, a trend that has been ongoing. And so thinking about how in a world where you will need to be much more upfront about what you're doing with data, how you're using it, um, how you're collecting it, what, what users are giving you access to use for what purposes, just thinking of a couple steps ahead and not being super reactive to this specific set of changes um, because it won't be the last and this will be a continuing trend both due to consumer demand um, as well as shifting mindsets within, within the tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, you know, at checkout, the first party data or, or, or what, what uh, checkout data that we're able to glean is, is a great example of the first party data um, that Brittany talked about earlier. But what other um, examples of, of digital trends are we seeing um, that are, I guess, post apocalyptic um, or, or what's on the horizon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it really is. I think first party data is the name of the game right now. That's what everybody is talking about. Um, and if I'm, you know, thinking about myself being a, a retailer or working on a team uh, and what does this mean for me and what should I be doing? Okay, I've heard about first party data, but practically speaking, where do I start? I think mm -hmm. it's very important to begin to understand the data that you have internally at your company. So what do you collect and what do you have? What do you not have? Where is it housed? How do you access it? Um, I've traditionally seen a lot of organizations that structure themselves in a way that these are really uh, siloed teams within the company, right? You have uh, performance marketers, you have brand marketers, sometimes they're not even on the same team. Uh, and then you have data architecture, you might have data science teams um, and other functions that really aren't collaborating very often. And if you have that kind of a structure, that's not going to work going forward. That goes kind of back to what Greg was saying about really embracing this mindset shift. Um, and I think the, the reality is too, same thing with budgets. So if you're in a position where you know that your data infrastructure and your data architecture needs work, but you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on your paid media and aren't investing in data infrastructure, that's not an optimized investment mix. And that might be a difficult thing for some companies since those budgets maybe aren't shared, but it's time to start shifting some investment to your data infrastructure so that you can really access that first party data and collect it. Um, some, some companies are using customer data platforms or CDPs to do this. That isn't the only way to do it, but that's another buzzword that I hear a lot. It's almost as if, I mean, this was a perfect storm for proponents of UX and good UX, right? It's like, um, I, I think as a, as a lead gen, demand gen marketer, uh, we're always concerned about the top of the funnel, but this whole tweak to how we collect data and what data we're able to collect has really forced us to contextualize the on-site experience better and then post purchase, use that information to really create an amazing post-purchase experience, all of which is made more available through the, the heightened prioritization of first-party data. Is that, is that what you're, you're thinking and seeing, Greg? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll mostly just reiterate what Brittany said and what you said, which is just that the, it just puts a more intense focus on what you can do with the data you have and you have access to, right? And before, I think you, you could obviously get away with, with spending less time there and, and relying on um, third-party data to, to power uh, these experiences and to improve your, your marketing funnel, but um, that's that's changing. And so the, like Brittany said, you, just just necessitates a greater percentage investment in your own data and how you're collecting it, how you're leveraging it, um, and how you're actually using it to to improve the end to end kind of shopper lifecycle. So, like, what what impacts are you seeing, Brittany? Like, what what should I mean? There are going well. Obviously, we've we've already had this with Firefox, iOS to an extent, um, mm-hmm. and then in the future, Chrome. I mean, what impact should people expect? How should they prepare? What what maybe quick win tactics can they, you know, can they consider? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think in addition to really understanding your company's data situation, the data infrastructure, so that you're poised really to move to a first party data strategy. I think the other thing that's really important is to understand how reliant you are today on third party data. Mm -hmm. So how much of your marketing mix is based on audiences that are built off of third party cookies? Um, And then really start to think about diversifying your marketing mix. Um, I think it's really common, especially for advertisers that spend a lot across the web on programmatic display, for example, are really heavily using these in-market audiences and these uh, interest audiences and then doing a lot of retargeting as well. So there will still be some opportunities to do retargeting within the walled gardens. You know, if somebody sees a Facebook ad uh, or interacts with one of your Facebook ads, then you can retarget to them still within Facebook, but it will be limited compared to how it is today. So I think um, really taking stock of your current diversification and, and how much impact you think your company will see, and then starting that education campaign now around mm-hmm. getting that diversification and, and really letting everyone know what the impacts will be and how you're preparing for it. Greg, are you think, seeing similar? Or, uh, I mean, another question I had for you, Greg, is, is what touch points do realtors need to be taking advantage of, you know, particularly on the first party yeah. data side? Yeah, I, I think that's um, pro- basically what I was going to say, which is, again, it's really just about a shift in focus. And as, as anything like this happens and kind of the, the underlying assumptions you had change, you need to reassess the entire kind of fun- life cycle and funnel uh, for shoppers and see where should you be making your investments based on this change or where should you be shifting your investments based on this change to better optimize to this new reality. So thinking about, again, that that journey of kind of top of the funnel to uh, kind of product discovery to consideration of purchase to purchase to post-purchase to advocacy and where you can actually better invest your time now that some of these retargeting uh, tactics and and kind of uh, top of funnel uh, uh, kind of cross uh, site experiences no longer will be possible in such a way that you're still allocating your resources effectively and able to compete against everyone across across the board. Right, this is just a big new piece of information that should. Uh, allow you to rethink things kind of from the ground up and you shouldn't assume that how you were investing in structuring things previously is still going to be the case um, as this continues to happen. Yeah. And to your point, Brittany, also, I mean, this is forces teams to work together internally, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's required now um, as we look through the entire funnel. What about attribution? I mean, as a merchant in my previous life, I always kind of was lukewarm to the attribution conversation and trusted my gut more than I trusted um, some of the attribution metrics. Like how how does the cookie apocalypse impact our attribution models? One of my favorite topics. I I think you had it right, Ian, trusting your gut. I think more marketers need to trust their gut, quite frankly, Uh, because I think the reality is, as we see the deprecation of third-party cookies really just continue to accelerate with this latest news, there won't be consistency in our platform metrics, right? We're going to see uh, a, a loss of some visibility. And I think what is important is to shift that uh, focus from the platform metrics, what you might see in Facebook or Google ads or Google analytics, and really look at your business metrics. So look at the overall top line metrics of uh, your total sales, your total revenue, lifetime value of the customers that you're bringing in. Um, And I do think this makes things harder on the attribution side, but things have been getting harder on the attribution side for many, many years. 
Um, and again, I'll, I'll kind of harken back to the iOS 14 uh, rollout that we've seen over the last few months. I mean, first of all, it, it's been difficult with Facebook for a long time because of the mobile first nature. The vast majority of their traffic is coming through mobile devices. Um, but we also know that uh, what we're seeing in Google Analytics or Facebook for our Facebook performance for sales that are influencer driven by Facebook, it's not the full picture. And so I think where some marketers have already gotten on board with, okay, we can't just look at the directly attributable metrics mm -hmm. to evaluate Facebook. That's just going to be true across the board. And so I think breaking that reliance on directly attributable performance and getting more comfortable looking at the relationship between ad investment or marketing investment overall, and then the business metrics that you're seeing, that's really the future. And I, I think for people that have been in performance marketing in particular for a long time, that can be really uncomfortable. Uh, but I think that's really the direction we need to head and looking at things like media mix optimization and test and learn strategies. It's, it's going to be the only way to really measure how these things are working. Yeah, amazing. I imagine growth of affiliate as well and a lot more uh, look into that data. Yeah, one, one other uh, kind of nuance here as well is that these changes are also making the lives of these platforms a lot more challenging, right? So they don't have the same level of data they used to have to be mm. able to create better user experiences. And so a trend that we're starting to see, which, which will likely continue as these changes continue to, to kind of grow in force, is these platforms looking for opportunities to bring the, the buying experience into their platform, right? Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram has already been making a huge push on this. And this is, I mean, they'll say a lot of other reasons uh, publicly, but this is the reason, right, that, that they're really pushing in that direction. And so that's also something you need to factor in is that that's going to continue to happen and you need to balance how much, like there's value in that because you'll get 100% accurate attribution, uh, but there's concerns in that, in that Facebook and Instagram are taking over more control of the customer experience, and you're potentially losing access to some of that first party data that we just talked about. Um, and so the balance there of, of how you embrace some of those opportunities as, as that continues to happen is they can be really interesting sources of new customers, uh, while also thinking a bit more strategically about what that means for your business and how much you want to invest in those channels because of those like downstream effects of uh, kind of Facebook gaining all that first party data and, and uh, retailers losing some of that. Um, so I, I don't think there's an obvious answer to that challenge yet, but I think it's something that the people should be thoughtful about as these changes continue to happen. And uh, Facebook will not be the last platform or Facebook will not be the last platform to, to do that. Right? I think a lot of these places where shoppers are discovering products will continue to bring those buying experiences mm -hmm. in-house over time. It's, it's seemingly a balance of, of obviously a heightened need for omni-channel while also holding your first party data incredibly close. For sure. Yeah. Well, and, and one question we did receive was, I guess, um, uh, you know, a reliance on first party data. There's a little bit of a concern of, will I, do I have to worry about that data going away? Um, can, Greg, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I think we, Brittany kind of alluded, I, I alluded it to it earlier. I, I don't think that you're ever going to fully lose first party data, right? That's not something to be concerned about. It's, it's um, your direct relationship with the shopper. I think uh, you will need to be thoughtful about how you capture that data, how transparent you are about how you're capturing that data and what you're using that data for in the future. Um, and so thinking about that now and having a perspective and principles on it now will only help you if this trend continues. Um, but I don't think there's any concern you should have for, for completely losing access to it. it. It just may change how you have to collect it and, and what level of uh, either visibility or opt-in you need to give the end user when you're collecting it, um, which, which I think is, is important to, to consider as you're making these changes with the third-party cookie um, mm -hmm. cookies going away. It's amazing what everything the merchants are having to consider now, how things have changed over a year, let alone five or 10. We have about, yeah, we have about four minutes. Um, I do want to continue to invite anyone on, on watching to, to post a question via the Q&A, but we did have some key takeaways that we wanted to go through. And maybe, if, uh, I think we've touched on a lot of these, but maybe if you guys want to just uh, offer a little bit on each of these. Sure, I, I can kick us off, uh, just also building off of what Greg just said, you know, really uh, another one of the buzzwords and, and things that people are asking about is zero party 
data, which is essentially just first party data that is collected transparently, where the consumer knows what is being collected about them and ideally understands why. And I think when you're wondering about first party data and will it continue to be available to me? Is it safe? I think the more transparently you're collecting it, the safer it will be, because I think it's important to recall that a big reason for the loss of third-party cookies and the reason we're even in this situation is the focus on privacy and kind of the, the public backlash there's been to, you know, ads feeling creepy sometimes or um, kind of being too invasive overall. So I, I think what Greg said at the beginning about embracing this change and really embracing the spirit of it and moving in a direction that um, is very transparent. And, you know, even thinking about site personalization and, and what you can offer to consumers, having that um, value exchange of, okay, if you tell me who you are, if you log into my site when you come, uh, I will give you personalized recommendations. I will let you build a wish list. You know, I can give you access mm -hmm. to sales and promotions or a loyalty program. Um, so I, I think that's something to really be thinking about as you're looking toward your first and zero party data. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just kind of add to that. I, I think yeah, a, a real focus on, on that piece um, will will pay dividends down the line and thinking about how you, in, both how you encourage uh, kind of deeper engagement, account creation, identity creation, things like that, but also how you make that uh, a first party citizen on your e-commerce experience, right? It's for, for a lot of retailers, most of their uh, uh kind of customers use guest checkout, they don't create an account, the, the registration process, login process is, can be challenging. Um, it's not necessarily a core focus um, of, of the retailer versus top of funnel or product discovery or search or mm -hmm. checkout. Um, and I think it becoming a first class citizen is, is necessary um, as these kind of changes continue to happen. Um, to be able to to have that first party data and have it associated with an identity that you can use um, for retargeting and marketing and uh, personalization and advocacy and referrals and everything in, in between. Yeah, I think we're seeing obviously LTV lifetime value of a customer is going to be that much more important. And I think um, I don't want to say merchants got lazy or advertisers got lazy, but it, there was I think we spent a lot more time just. Uh, flooding the top of the funnel and not spending all, all that much time on personalization or, or being that that first, you know, a, a good citizen of the internet, of, of the website, and then how we focus on the customer post acquisition. And I think they're just going to be that much more uh, important now to both of your points. We did receive uh, one question. Um, given GDPR legislation in Europe, do we see a similar, same, different impact uh, happening in Europe with this? Yeah, I think that Europe has already been ahead, right? Like, like you mentioned, um, with the GDPR legislation, the need for transparency has been first and foremost, and there's additional legislation coming down the pipe. And, and actually, I was, I was going to give an example. Um, on the payment side, uh, Europe has also introduced a concept of 3DS2, where you have to add additional levels of verification uh, for shoppers in some instances. And that's a great example of the people who are thinking ahead and already had those levels of verification in their payment processes were able to bypass that kind of clunky bank driven experience for users and use their own first party experience uh, because they were thinking ahead. And so I think the same things will apply on the privacy side as well. If you're thinking ahead and being very thoughtful about how you're collecting this data, how you're using it, how you're giving people the controls and ability uh, to, to change how that data is used, um, in a lot of cases, you'll end up with uh, a much better consumer experiences as these additional changes come down the pipe in terms of legislation or um, kind of the tech giants changing their policies. I, I, I'll just add to that. I think that's a great point, Greg, of just really going back again to the spirit of where all of this is coming from. And, and Europe has been uh, ahead of the U.S. a bit on this, but you know, we're not too far behind with CCPA and some of the other legislation in New York that's in the pipe. So I think, again, if you can get back to this idea of, you know, consumers want privacy, but they also want personalization. And Ian, you referenced this earlier. It's like everybody wants a little bit of both. And I think there is a way to acknowledge and address both of those for your consumers. It's just going to take a little bit of a more thoughtful approach, a little bit more transparency on the data gathering side, and then also uh, actually using the data that you do gather then 
to personalize. And I think, mm-hmm. Ian, you, you made this point a moment ago of you know, marketers didn't necessarily get lazy. Uh, well, some might say that. Uh, but, you know, I've seen I've seen too many companies that collect email lists and then use that email list to send the same message to everybody on the list. Well, you need to be collecting the data and then segmenting it and then activating on it in a way that makes consumers feel like there was a reason that they gave that information. Uh, so I think as long as you're embracing that spirit and trying to be ahead of the curve, um, then you know, you'll know you be a little bit more prepared for what else does come. We'll, we'll definitely be talking to Clavio, I'm sure, in a month or two. Um, <laughs> so um, as I think our time is rounding out, we don't have any more questions. Um, we could just, uh, Greg, if you have any points you just want to close us out on, and then Brittany, and then we'll... Uh, Say farewell. Yeah, I think a, just a reiteration of, of everything we've talked about, which is um, at the highest level, you should use these changes as an opportunity to just revisit the strategy holistically and not just think about the individual piece of your strategy this is impacting, which is you know, top of the funnel marketing retargeting, but think more holistically about everything that you're doing across the board or to, to drive uh, both kind of first-time shoppers and shopper LTV and where you should kind of shift your strategy and replace your bets based on these mm-hmm. changes. So I think that's the most important like big picture way to take out of this is don't just be reactive um, to this one change, like use this as a reason to think more holistically. I love that. And I, I think uh, it's maybe a little predictable for anyone who knows me, but uh, I think I'll end um, with a little bit of a message on the measurement and attribution piece. And I do think that these testing strategies are so important Um, and just being able to have the type of organization that has, first of all, the buy-in to run tests, because I I think that can be a hurdle for a lot of companies to even, you know, run the risk, quote unquote, of having a holdout test, for example, Um, and really reframing that conversation around the risk of not testing. And this is what we have to do to drive our programs forward. Um, And I think that some some organizations are great at this and and others have a little bit more uh, reluctance. And I think it can be a lot more simple than a lot of people realize, you know, something as simple as a geo holdout test um, and just running a marketing campaign in certain states and not others, and then tying that back again to the overall business metrics that you're looking at. Uh, So, you know, net new customers added that month or maybe LTV, depending on the type of the campaign. Um, I think really spending some time thinking about how you're measuring, how are you defining success um, and making sure that you're in a position and really equipped to run those. Um, And then it's not so scary to be losing a little bit of this visibility because you have a bigger, you know, future proof strategy for testing and learning. I think the geo part is huge. It's something I was a huge proponent with of when I was on the merchant side and, and really beat the drum on. Um, I mean, for my part, I'll just say invest on, in your customer experience just across the board, right? From uh, cradle to grave and uh, create, as Greg kept saying, create um, advocates. Do everything you can to create advocates and, and spread the word about your brand because ultimately that's um, the most cost efficient way to uh, gain new customers. Well, cool. Well, thanks. This has been really eye-opening and great. And um, yeah, I think this has been a, a, a great 30 minutes and went super fast. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you, Ian and Greg. It was fantastic talking to you. Good one.